बैकग्राउंड का बहुत ही so i was in technically i'm kind of outlier in software industry because my degree is in metallurgy graduation post graduation both <laughs> uh, software was my hobby and later it became a profession i kind of had a running fight with quality and project managers for many years always asking them they will ask me to fill some check checklist and i'll ask them why <laughs> so that's how i started and that's where i that habit of why is where i i started when i started in consulting i called myself craftsman partly because i think software engineering doesn't exist here submit but it's not really a art as well somewhere in between so it's a craft and i am a craftsman of that craft the only difference is i think continuously about my craft and think about how i can improve why things work why they don't work and today's talk is about also about all those things in the sense see the way i think about when somebody says i am doing agile my first reaction first thought that comes to my mind is this guy has not understood agile because it's not really about doing agile it's about being agile right? and being agile happens only when you have a right kind of habits the question is there are a lot of practices documented like scrum practices that uh, all the scrum ceremonies that you have but i don't really find any documentation or any advice for individual developer what he should do every day so that he can be agile and that's where i started and over years i developed some practices so all the habit suggestions are backed by theory evidence research i practice what i preach so all the habits that are here i am practicing every day for last 25 years because i still program every day i have consciously avoided of becoming a project manager <laughs> nothing against project manager but it's a entirely different skill and i tried being project manager and realized that it doesn't work for me so i decided that i will remain in my expertise which is technical architecture system setups and all kinds of things and that's it so these definitely are not myths these definitely are not urban legend that common practices followed without thought and you will find that in in one of two of my ideas you will find them controversial <laughs> that's okay as i said no animals were harmed in developing these slides but <laughs> if you know me probably some developers were harmed <laughs> so let's start with a fundamental question we know agile works we know agile works better than waterfall but why the answer lies in the question why so asking questions why was not there in the waterfall model it was just documentation and then <coughs> just take development here there is no feedback loop so feedback loop comes later in agile of course feedback comes early and why question is the first thing that is been asked why we are developing this absolutely see the, the word that feedback comes early is actually the reason why agile works and and i had a habit of this why 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 kind of thing and i realized that why agile works because of let's let me digress a little bit i'll come to that question again this is a typical graph you might find at various places cost of fixing a bug in design it is 1x in implementation it is 6.5x when you go to testing it is 15x when you actually 
your product is in user's hand and then you get a bug, it's more like a 100x, right? Seen this kind of graph? Unfortunately, it is wrong. It is wrong. <laughs> Why do you think it is wrong? Let's come back to a simple example. I did a coding error, okay? And my implementation time is, I'm saying it's 6.x, 5x my cost of fixing a bug. But if I do a coding error, and I fix it next day, is the cost still 65, 6.5%, 6.5x? Not really true. So how, does, how do you determine the cost? What impacts the cost? If you see more and if you play with more, the cost of fixing a defect depends on when the defect is introduced and when the defect is fixed. Higher the distance, exponentially your cost increases. So if you find a spec bug in when you deliver a software, you have a 100x cost. But if you find a coding bug during the implementation phase itself, the cost is way less. It's not really 6.5x much less than that. But if you find a coding bug when your software is delivered, the cost is increasing exponentially. Now if you keep that in mind, then if you think about agile practices, all the agile practices if you ask why, they are actually trying to reduce this time. Look at any agile practice. What do you do by pair programming? You are a guy sitting next to you looking at your code and what you are trying to do is reduce this distance between a coding error to fixing that error. Look at delivery. Build failure, in the one day you are getting a feedback. So a feedback loop is not about just about having a feedback loop, it's having a really small fast feedback loop. Keep that in mind. So typically this principle if you see everywhere it's called fail fast. You must have heard this word, right? Everywhere, even in startup world, you will see fail fast, fail fast. Why fail fast? Because it reduces your cost. And if you look at, um, this is an interesting dilemma, because if you look at how waterfall works, waterfall goes extreme lengths to avoid errors. While as what Agile says, it's impossible to avoid errors, but the moment you find the error, fix it immediately, don't wait. And if you fix it immediately, your success rate is going to be higher. And I have a habit of reading all kinds of things. And this is a quote I found by Ed Catmull. Ed Catmull is head of Pixar and Disney. Do not fall for the illusion that by preventing errors, you won't have errors to fix. The truth is, cost of fixing, preventing errors is often far greater than cost of fixing them. I find this interesting because I find the exact same kind of solution coming in from a creative company like Pixar in software development. And if you look at Toyota, the Toyota way, the first thing it says that anybody can stop a product line. Anybody can talk, stop an assembly line. What do you mean by stopping the assembly line? If you see a problem, stop the assembly line, fix it, continue the assembly line you are doing exact same principle, fail fast in manufacturing. And Toyota is the lowest cost, highest quality manufacturer of car. Same principle. The question is, can we apply this principle in our day-to-day -day development practice? And if you look at what we do, you will find that we, why we say that we are following Agile, but in our day-to-day -day practices, we don't follow fail fast, we end up following how do I prevent it. Rather than how do I quickly fix that. So what I'm going to talk now is three, four things about day-to-day -day development practices where we say that how do we fix the error immediately. So to minimize the cost of defects, focus on reducing the distance between defect introduced to defect fixed. <laughs> And this is a question you should ask in all your processes. If you find any process where this distance is high, 
I'll guarantee you that that process will fail in practice. It doesn't matter how well intentioned it is. Well intentioned does not make it effective. So then use the technique. So key thing, you have to fail immediately and you have to fail visibly. You have to fail immediately, you have to fail visibly and then you have to fix immediately. You follow these three practices consistently, you will find that your development practices and the effectiveness of those practices will dramatically change. In fact, you will see an extreme visible difference in three months. So how do you fail fast daily? So simplest way to fail fast for any programmer today is to look at compiler one. Think about it, what do we do in a typical developer scenario? We take a file, we compile it, we get a successful exe, what is the message? 200 errors, uh, sorry, 200 warnings, zero errors, we stop. How many of you have projects which have zero warnings? Zero warnings. You know, one of my project I was in uh, recently in Geometric, I was chief software engineer <laughs> and actually forced a team to change their compiler settings where I reported, Visual Studio by the way has this setting. You can report warnings and errors. And the moment you change that, your compilation stops. So we forced that setting. And everybody cursed me for the next two weeks. <laughs> Two weeks later, what happened is, they, now at this point I actually asked them to reduce the warning level to just one. So they had warning level two, I made it three, and then I made it level three, zero warnings. And what they realized is that a lot of their long pending, unpredictable bugs just disappeared. Just disappeared. So code with zero warnings and zero static analysis errors. You have, everybody now has build system, right? Can you fail the build if you have at least one, only in, even a one warning? It sounds drastic, but try it out and you will find that your code quality dramatically increases. And I find all kinds of strange practices in the name of Agile. One of the team I was talking to, they said, no, no, we have a sprint at the near to the end of release cycle and in that sprint we fix all static analysis errors. Come on, you already made a mistake, you are continuing with that mistake for three months and of course those bugs are getting reported to the QA, QA is wasting time fixing those bugs, you are spending time debugging those bugs where you have a static analysis tool which is telling you you have a bug on this file in this line. Why do you want to waste time? If you speak static analysis errors next day and if that is your rule, find your coding really, really increases very fast. And there is also a message to the developers. Slopy coding is not tolerated. Because warning, having so many warnings, to me, is unprofessional software development. If you are a professional software developer, how the hell can you tolerate a warning? It means your code has some problem. Basically, you are telling the world that we know our code has problem, but we don't want to do anything about it. How is that an agile attitude? <laughs> you are talking about quality, then how can you tolerate what? Yeah. And when I, I had this habit of talking to a lot of people, and I find all kinds of interesting things. Lot of, lot of projects have warning levels set to one, which basically means you are not getting any warning. 
if you are talking about a visual studio ideally you should have zero warnings at level 4 okay. and if you turn on level 4 for your project you will find you usually you get around especially if you are like million plus lines of code you will probably in the range of 10000 words each warning practically is equivalent to an undiscovered bug So, suppose you are in that situation, what do you do? There are two ways typically to fix this problem, where people have, okay, we will have a sprint to fix warnings. And usually that doesn't work. Why? Because fixing warning is an extremely boring job. You end up making more mistakes. If you say I have a two weeks of just bug fixing or warning fixing, what you should do is very simple. First thing, come in the morning, every developer fixes one warning and commits. Okay. If you have a 20 people team, you are fixing 20 warnings every day. That means 400 warnings gone in a month. Any typical conventional project, you will find that within three months, a lot of your problems just disappear. Thing is, every generation of compiler improves on their warning detection. So you will find that I change the compiler and new warnings have appeared. Or I used to work on Windows and now we ported it on Linux and new warnings have appeared. Keep fixing those. New generation of compiler has new generation of capabilities. We have to take advantage of it. Agile is all about taking full advantage of tools that you have. Next thing you have to follow is commit early and commit often. Version control is designed for commit early and commit over. Commit 10 times in a day. Okay. But now uh, here is the interesting thing. What is the purpose of version control? Version control's purpose is not backup. Somebody asked me once, I was I was getting a knife. Uh, WhatsApp, you get all kinds of forwards, right? So I got one forward which says, What is the purpose of break? Break allows you to go faster, which is counterintuitive. Because if you don't have brakes, everybody will drive very cautiously and your traffic will actually crawl. The version control is exactly like that. It allows you to go faster. It's a way to quickly recover from your errors. Suppose you are committing every small change and you discover that I made this change and something which was working has stopped working. First developer instinct is to debug. But if you are committing small changes, the best way for you is just throw away your changes and go back to what was the last good commit that you had and do the changes again. Again, it's a counterintuitive thing, but it works beautifully. Provided you work in small chunks. You commit in small chunks. Now you will find this advice on the net everywhere. Commit early, commit often. What prevents people from doing? Let's say I am a guy who, who wants to commit every small thing. Right? But there is company policy which says that every commit has to be manually reviewed. Is that going to work? So we are creating policies which go against the basic philosophy of version control. That is where sometimes when you move from subversion to uh, version control systems like Git help, because Git allows me to commit small things, but I will not push. Okay, I don't have to worry. Which is effectively a bypass from stupid processes. It's a stupid process. The fact is, manual code review 
of every single line of code works only in shuttle software because that's where the practice came from it never works in a normal development scenario never why again what's the problem one problem i see is that manual code review every time you have to do it has to go through a review process what happens in that review process who is supposed to do the review typically your most senior guy he is also the guy who is hard pressed for time so he is not going to review your code right so your code will probably get reviewed one week later what is the purpose of code review fail fast i coded yesterday i want to find the problems tomorrow not two weeks later but if my code review is going to happen one week later distance is increased effectiveness of code review is decreased also look at okay from the guy who is doing the code review what the hell is his motivation to do the reviews of 10 people everybody every developers think that i am here to solve a problem i am not here to see everybody is code and see you have done a mistake here you have done a mistake here i will do that second thing is more psychological if you are the manager or the top management where do you really want your best people to spend their time writing bug free code or looking at stupid code and trying to fix those bugs in which way you look 100% manual code review has a horrible ROI so what's the job first thing is you have to have a static analysis tool built into your daily life first level of review will be done by a static analysis tool Typically, every project has a 80-20 rule. 20% of your files are critical, 80% files are not. Identify those 20% files and say, any change in this, we have to do manually. Any change in the remaining 80%, let the static analysis tool take care of it. Believe me, your senior developers will be the most happy people with this change, and it will also be way more effective. another interesting in thing in code review every company i have seen starts with a code review checklist and that is another thing which never work never i have not seen a single scenario where code review checklist work why it doesn't work everybody starts with some good intention in case of agile and software the road to hell is paved with good intention is a very very something you will experience every day so we start with the checklist we start with probably in a single team uh, maybe a 20 20 25 team checklist then somebody realizes that uh, okay let's make it reusable and we'll adopt it to some other team also and that team adds another 24 items then somebody tries to combine multiple technologies in the checklist and pretty soon you have a 10 page 25 page checklist do you really really think that when i'm doing a review of say 50 line i'm going to go through that 25 checklist and do a tick seriously no not going to happen so what happens people will take that and because it's part of the process they will tick 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 without even thinking about it again something goes wrong if you really want to see how to create good checklist a really good checklist i suggest you read a book called checklist manifesto and the author is dr atul govande and he talks about creating checklist in surgery who safe surgery checklist is created by dr atul govande and his team and that guy has the best advice of checklist which works 
if you are, you know, if you remember only few things out of this, I'll suggest that get rid of your man code review checklist. Last thing, again, this is from really from developer point of view. Yes. Write small. Now I always have a debate of how small is small. Okay. Is 50 line function small? 120 line function small? So there's a lot of debate, and then I had a very simple thumb rule. Entire function has to be visible in your IDE without doing page up or page down. <laughs> which approximates to about 25 to 40 lines. That's the typical page size in IT. So my rule of thumb in my teams everywhere, 25 years is 25 lines is maximum function size. You want to write more than that, you have to convince me that you cannot write it in less than 25. <laughs> 25 years, nobody succeeded. I can always show them how to write it in a smaller way. Now again, I have this question of, I know it works, but why? Why does small function work better than large functions? There are two, three immediately visible things. You, you read the function, entire function is visible, all code paths in that function are visible. Right? So debugging is much more easy. You look at the function and you can see how the code is going to flow and potentially which code path will have a problem. It reduces code duplication. Because this is another con majority of cases when I did analyze that code and I discovered that there is high incidence of code duplication when the project has really, really large functions. Because what you end up with is I have this big 500 line function and I want 50 lines out of it. And since I cannot call that function for those 50 lines, I end up copying the space. That's how it happens. That's how copy this thing spread. So if I have an intention that you are going to write 25 line function no matter what, a lot of things change. How complex a code you can write in 25 line? Right? Your complexity goes down. How many return statements you can have in a 25 line function? Multiple returns go down. Every function you have to give a name, you have to give parameters. If you are giving good function names, that itself starts acting as your document. Because somewhere on the top, you are going to call a series of functions. And based on those function names, we can immediately identify the logic what you are doing. If you write a 500 line function, you have to add, keep adding comments at various places. If you write 25 line function, comments are mostly spurious. When I joined Geometric around 95-96, I, I was working at having a coffee and I heard this weird conversation between three developers. And they are talking about, you know, this guy is great, amazing developer. And I started listening because I was always trying to learn from amazing developers. And the next statement, nobody understands his code. <laughs> Now I got confused. <laughs> Nobody understands his code and he is an amazing developer. Come on boss, that is not amazing developer, that is called job security. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody understands the code, there is no way you can replace him, right? <laughs> Flip side, if you are the developer, is probably you are not going to get promotion also. Because if you get promoted, who will maintain it? <laughs> More interesting, again, I keep reading a lot of things and I found this interesting anecdote. 1950s, and there was a lot of brain research going on, I repeatedly confirmed, repeatedly confirmed that average human brain can remember five to seven things at a time. Five to seven things at a time. 
Now think about you have 500 line function. How many code paths you are going to have? Obviously, you cannot remember them in mind. You have to keep on noting it down, going back and forth, going, going page up, page down. Your debugging efficiency is going to be dramatically go down. And if you think about it, if you think about any life cycle, almost if you at any big project, 40 to 60 percent of time is spent in debugging and bug fixing. And we always wonder why waterfall bombs. Why waterfall bombs? Because bug fixing is your most unpredictable stage. You have no idea how many bugs will get reported. You have no idea how you will fix those. Once you debug it and determine the cause, then you can predict how much time it will take fix. But if you are a project manager, go to developer and ask, okay, this is a bug, how much time it will take to fix it? Very common question. Most of the time, developer has no idea how much time it will take to fix it. But you cannot say to project manager. <laughs> so he will pull out some number from the air and say. <laughs> That's how it happens. And manager has no way to counter that, so he has to accept. <laughs> so then you argue. Okay, you, it has to be fixed at critical, work on weekend or whatever, stay late, but you have to finish it. The problem is, you genuinely have no idea. Because unless you debug it and find out the cause, then you can predict how much time it will take to fix it. You cannot predict without doing debugging how much time to fix it. So if you want to control the time and schedule, the key thing you have to control is debug. How do I reduce unpredictability in debug? One way to reduce unpredictability is force writing small functions because automatically your debugging time decreases. Second thing, and I'm just going to mention it. I think we are running out of time. Right? Yeah. So, uh, another way to reduce your debugging time is assets. Yeah, I don't know how many of you heard of assets. No, who, what is asset? Asset is a small line of code which basically validates developer assumptions. Yeah. And consistently, research has proven that more assets you have in code after understanding it what asset means because asset is not error for error handling asset is for helping you debug if you use it consistently asset is one thing that can drastically reduce your debugging time and asset is something i have been continuously using in my project and one of the earliest project i did was for john deere i had a 12 people team and me and two others were experienced developers. My experience was five years. Everybody else was fresher. This was for multi-platform project, Sun and Windows. At every time when we delivered a EXE, we delivered 15 different EXEs. This was a C++ code written by 90% of the team which is precious and precious I mean not computer science. Those guys were mechanical engineers, joint geometry. We taught them two months of C++ and they joined. Okay. This was almost 100,000 lines of C++ code. In 2000, we delivered the project. John Deere used it for 10 years in 35 factories. They were cutting 2 million sheet metal parts on that system every year for 10 years. In 10 years, they didn't report a single crash. No memory leaks. 
if a team of freshers can deliver this team of experienced people can definitely do it and why very simple follow all these practices this is what i have been following and we delivered fantastic results thank you very much